And subliminally, it's like they're saying, hi, come on over here, naive British boy. You of all people need vitamin D. Hello, I'm Lawrence and I'm on a quest to uncover all of the memos that Britain and America lost in the pond and one of those memos pertains to pharmacies. I don't know about you, but in the last year I've been to a pharmacy more times than I've been to my actual house. I've even got a room there. And between the flu shots, COVID vaccine one, COVID vaccine two, the COVID booster shot and the COVID super deluxe, I've now got more holes in me than the plot of Police Academy 6. And so as somebody who's lived extensively in both Britain and America, you could say that I've become very familiar with the differences between British and American pharmacies. Here are five of them. Sometimes, depending on who I'm speaking to, I have to be careful about using the word pharmacy. Firstly, right here in the United States, that's not the only word that's used to describe a building from which you pick up your medications. And when I first moved here, drugstores sounded like the sort of place that you'd pick up products that are now legal in 18 states. As it turns out, it's where I get the secrets, which to be clear, are not a 1950s Motown girl group. On the other hand, growing up in Britain, a pharmacy was usually known as a chemist's. However, since I moved to the United States, it seems that this word is being used less and less. And if the NHS website is anything to go by, the word pharmacy is becoming more popular. Either way, it's not just the name of the building itself that bears a terminological difference. Let's take a look at some more. Famously, George Bernard Shaw once said that Britain and America were two nations divided by a common language. Evidently, he must have spent some time in line for a prescription, because a lot of the linguistic differences between our two countries can be found on the aisles of a pharmacy. For instance, the scientific names that are used for a certain medication used for treating pain or fever. In the United States, this medication might be known quite pleasingly as acetaminophen, such a good word, isn't it? But in this department, Britain is itself no slouch because the equivalent name, which also rolls off the tongue, is paracetamol. If there isn't yet a song about these two, I hereby claim the rights, although ironically, it could be quite painful for everyone else. And at the top of this video, you heard me talking about flu shots, and that's because in the United States, the actual vaccine is known as a shot. And if Twitter's anything to go by, it seems that since the emergence of COVID-19, Americans, much to their confusion, have become aware that in Britain, we refer to this as a jab, which in a roundabout way does make sense because jab is a boxing term. And the next day, you feel like you've been punched by Lennox Lewis. And trust me, I know what that feels like. And of course, right after they give you it, they stick a sticker on your arm to avoid infection or bleeding. In Britain, these are known as plasters, and in America, they're known as band-aids. And I can only think that Bob Geldof must feel like a right idiot. And then, of course, there's the way we say words. In America, it's the vitamin aisle. And in Britain, it's the vitamin azel. I'm kidding, it's still aisle. And on top of this, you have a host of brand differences for essentially the same things. To list all of those would be free advertising, and I'm above that. Just know you will run into it from one side of the pond to the other. So let's take a look at some of the major pharmacy outlets and, in doing so, offer them free advertising. I'm a liar. Now, it's fair to say that both countries have a multitude of different pharmacies to choose from. But it's also fair to say that both countries have two pharmacies that lead the way. In Britain, these are Lloyd's Pharmacy. That's all one word, because when you've got respiratory problems, who's got time for spaces? And Boots, formerly known as Boots the Chemist. Both companies look quite distinct from each other and, much to my initial surprise, are not to be found in the United States. Instead, you have CVS and Walgreens, and there's a reason that I mentioned a moment ago that Boots and Lloyd's Pharmacy are quite distinct from each other. Because the first thing I noticed about Walgreens and CVS is how confusingly similar they are. Additionally, for the first year of living in the US, I thought Walmart and Walgreens were part of the same company. So just to clarify for my British viewers who might be hearing about Walgreens for the first time, they are not connected. But just as Walmart has dipped its fingers into British retail, so has Walgreens. To the extent that Boots is now owned by the Walgreens Boots Alliance, which sounds suspiciously like a militia, or maliciously like a suspicion. I don't know what I'm saying, it's Vlogmas, I've been at the NyQuil. 
One major difference that stood out to me early on was the relative location of each country's big two pharmacies. And what do I mean by location? Well, the sorts of places you might find them within a town or city. In the US, you may or may not need a vehicle in order to reach a CVS or a Walgreens. And that's because sometimes they're located out near strip malls and the like. But even if they're just in the downtown area, which is often the case, both pharmacies usually have a parking lot slash car park. And some even have a drive through but don't worry fellow Brits, Americans aren't going to the drugstore to pick up a quarter pounder. We're just going there to pick up prescriptions, and no, it doesn't promote exercise. In Britain, the likes of Boots, Lloyd's Pharmacy and other chemists will usually be found along the High Street slash Main Street where you find some of the other shops. Additionally, you might also find them inside the shopping precinct slash mall. But either way, you don't usually have the opportunity to pull into a car park. And while I'm sure there are definitely exceptions these days, I don't remember ever seeing a drive through at a British pharmacy. Then again, I didn't drive because I wanted the exercise which I got from walking to the bus stop. And then there's the inside of the building. And after I moved to the United States, do you know what really stood out to me? It was the vitamin azel. It's not that we don't sell vitamin supplements in Britain. It's just that in America, they pop out at you. They've got these colorful yellow lids. And subliminally, it's like they're saying, hi, come on over here, naive British boy. You of all people need vitamin D. So that was my first impression. But then when I delved deep outside of the vitamin azel, I realized that the US had certain over-the-counter products that either weren't widely available in the UK or weren't legally available at all. Now, one of these is Neosporin, which for my British viewers is a medical medication that's used to reduce the risk of infection following minor skin injuries or skin injuries as they're known to cat owners like me. The thing about Neosporin is we don't seem to have an exact equivalent in the UK. On the other hand, the first time I was casually offered melatonin here to combat insomnia, my first thought was this doesn't seem like a lawful exchange. And that's because in the UK, melatonin can only be picked up if it's prescribed by a doctor. And then as everybody knows, the actual biggest difference between Britain and America is our dental care. And this is highlighted perhaps best by the pharmaceutical availability of crest white strips. As the name suggests, they're used for whitening teeth and they're quite popular in America. In the UK, crest white strips are not legally available. And that's because they contain a level of hydrogen peroxide that is above the UK legal limit. So whichever way you slice it, that really is food for thought or something to get your teeth into or is there any others? Extract from that what you will. That's it for this episode. Let me know in the comments below your experience with British and American pharmacies. I'm Lawrence Brown. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss any more Vlogmas episodes. As always, a massive shout out to my patrons who make these videos possible. If you would like to become a patron of Lost in the Pond, you can do so today at patreon.com slash lostinthepond. Until the next video, goodbye.